like every, I'd like to introduce to you Stanley Rosenblatt, the chairman of our foundation, who will make some remarks. Dr. Davis and Bransky, who all of you know. Uh, he's sitting at the same table with me. I got him very nervous because I looked at the CD, which could choke the proverbial horse. But I said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do a very condensed version. Uh, Dr. Zabransky is the director of head and neck cancer research at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a professor of otolaryngology. He's a professor of oncology. He's a professor of pathology, cellular and molecular medicine, as well as neurology. Is it, is it any wonder that the members of the board of trustees call him Dr. Versatility? <laughs> and um, he has written on every imaginable subject uh, articles that have appeared in all the peer-reviewed uh, journals. And one of the reasons that he is so, such an incredibly valuable resource as chairman of the Medical Advisory Board is because uh, he, he's, his career has covered both worlds. He had an internship and a residency in internal medicine before he went into molecular genetics and oncology. So uh, we're, we're, we're blessed to have him because he's had a hands-on practice plus uh, groundbreaking research. And as Beth Press, our executive director, can tell you, as incredibly busy as he is, he is tremendously responsive when any member of the Board of Trustees calls him or Beth calls him to ask our unbelievably dumb questions and he, he pretends as though they're intelligent questions, and he, he, he answers them. And I think he's got a tremendously interesting subject tonight, uh, the odyssey of the most recent Surgeon General's report. And believe me, it is an odyssey, and he's got quite a story to tell. So it's our pleasure to introduce at this time Dr. David Sabransky. The Jewish wedding is bringing my mother to get an introduction. Um, so, so first of all, uh, the formality aside, I just um, thought it would be interesting tonight to talk to you about a um, faithful decision that I made. Um, maybe as faithful as the time that Stanley Susan asked me to come and testify in the Anvil case once, and then again, some dead twice again. And I always say yes to these things, and yet the, you know, it's all a learning experience and a, and, a, and a remarkable journey of life of trying to figure it out. Uh, how to deal with these situations. Um, and of course, um, this one, writing the Surgeon General's report, which is supposed to come out soon, um, you'll see as I go through the slides that a lot of them actually were already printed by the government to be 2009, it ain't gonna happen. It's already 2010, and I'm still hopeful that it will have the 2010 seal. Uh, but it all came about from an um, initial conversation that I had with David Burns actually here at Family. And he said, you know, Jonathan Salmon and I have been talking and we decided that, you know, the next topic of the Surgeon General's report is going to be basic mechanisms of disease. We think you'd be a great candidate to edit the report. And of course, having only peripherally looked at these reports and read some of it, I said, that sounds like something interesting you might be able to do. And then I said, how many chapters do they usually have? He says, they usually have seven or eight chapters. So I figured in my experience writing a book of seven or eight chapters won't, won't be much of a deal. And then David Burns kind of laughed and chuckled and said, we'll, we'll get in touch with you uh, as we're going to do this. And um, I have been telling you, the last three and a half years have been quite a journey in, in producing this, this very important piece of work. Um, so what I wanted to do was uh, tell you a little bit of, of just my perception of what it was as we went through writing this. And maybe starting um, by just giving you a little bit of historical context. Many, many times here you've seen, and I know scientists sometimes we don't look at this because it's really something that is not a general 
a textbook that we look at, but the 1964 Surgeon General Report on Smoking, which was the landmark study, is extremely important from a policy point of view. And um, it was based predominantly on epidemiologic studies, but it was really what coalesced, I think, the entire country around the notion that smoking was bad and something had to be done. I mean, I remember as a child uh, listening to the fact that this report had come out and taking my parents' cigarettes, breaking them up and flushing them down the toilet. So something clicked at that time that, um, you know, when I heard that, this, that, that smoking was bad. And, I, and it was really interesting because as much as people talked about smoking being bad, until that report, nobody knew, supposedly, that it was, that it was really bad. Um, there have been 29 Surgeon General's reports that have been written now through the 2010. And if you go look, you can look on the website um, of, of the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. You can see there that almost all of them are related to smoking. So there are others that are related to, to infectious disease, they're related to women's health. But the vast majority, probably 7 or 8% have to do uh, with smoking. And as I said before, the big difference in this particular report was that it was really, the original reports were really all manifestations of the epidemiology, you know, exposure and how it led to different types of cancer, and really trying to use epidemiology to really ascertain and to come as close as you can to proving that certain cancers were caused by exposure to tobacco. And along the way, they added things, better biology, physiology, pharmacological evidence of addiction. But really, everybody's idea was the time had come, and I think family's an excellent example of that, that the research had been a level and a depth where you could actually write a detailed report about the exact mechanism of how smoking causes disease. So not just the epidemiologic associations, not just the physiology and some of the things that we know, but for example, how you know a benzopyrene binds to DNA, specifically mutates the gene like the and causes cancer. That kind of knowledge has been coming over the last 10 years. It was really never detailed before in most of these uh, reports. And that was basically the basic premise that, that, um, that, came, to, to, that, that came to this uh, historical uh, writing. 2010 is not the same as 1964. And, and one of the first things that I, I want to, that I think will become pretty evident, is I actually did not prepare any of the materials I'm going to show you. But in parallel, and this is something I had no idea about, I was just going to edit this report. In parallel, you begin to get emails about all kinds of materials that are being produced um, that are basically offshoots of the scientific material that comes in the Surgeon General reports. And these offshoots are really predominantly geared to the lay public. These are incredible opportunities that are seen by the Surgeon General and the government to be able to put some very specific messages across to everybody, scientists, doctors, and especially to be able to translate that for the lay person. So, so this material over here that, that you see here, and you see the, the 2009, because obviously they were expecting it to come out earlier, um, is, is the kind of material that you're going to see all over. And they really, what they really try to do is just basically take that information that we have and make it as simple as possible. I want to point out a couple of things, because I think family has to be very, very proud. Um, you know, I was talking at the table as we were looking at Alan Blum, you know, doing the presentations. I don't know, maybe we're getting to the age of 1987 and 1992. Don't look like that long ago. Um, and um, when you think that really family really is only 10 years old, which it's, it's really amazing that all this didn't happen that long ago. And when you look at the original Surgeon General Report in 1964, which preceded by many, many years, by decades, the work that the flight attendants did, and then eventually the formation of family, it's pretty impressive to see what this report says, because at the very top, the very first message is something that we all know. You know, tobacco kills 440,000 Americans. Okay, that's updated. That's important. But the second most important point that the Surgeon General wants you to know, after we wrote all that book and we put all that information together, 700 pages, you also may know that tobacco smoke hurts everyone who breathes it. At least 38,000 non-smokers die every year from breathing someone else's smoke. The second most important thing in this report is that smokers are not only doing it to themselves, they're doing it to everybody else around them. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Now, to give you credit where credit is due, in 2006, there was a Surgeon General report that talked about the issue of secondhand smoke. 
But again, that report focused on that, and yet with this, again, the message is second hand milk is bad. And the message you're going to see, which is a very important political component as I work through this report, came out over and over and over again. Two, the next thing that you're going to see here, which is the other very important message is you can and you should quit. That if I would summarize them beyond all the rest of the sciences, don't hurt those that are around you, stop smoking. Those are the messages that they want the lay audience and then the rest of the population to understand. You know, it is a scientific report, and you know, this is a scientific conference. So I just want to touch on these points. You no, know, I know that it may sound very simplistic because in the end, we take an entire chapter and you actually get down to one single bullet point which eventually enters the last, the last chapter in, in, in the report, which is the major conclusion. Um, I can only tell you that I have never even imagined in my entire life what kind of wordsmithing goes on as you write this one bullet point, and every single word gets reviewed over and over and over again. And you know, every time I complain to David Burns and Jonathan Sandman, they say, but that's what makes the Surgeon Show's report so special. Every word is looked at so carefully. Um, so, so just in the major conclusions, and again you'll see how the message gets taken, addiction of tobacco products based on nicotinic, is based on nicotinic receptors in the brain. Sounds pretty straightforward. We have a whole chapter on it. It's beautiful. It talks about the receptors, polymorphisms in the receptors, how nicotine binds, how it addicts you, how certain people are more susceptible than others. But in the end, the message that's going to come out of all of this is that nicotine is very addictive and we know the mechanism of how that happens. That also, of course, relates to the issue of using products that can potentially help you uh, quit smoking. The other issue, which we spent countless, I can't tell you how many uh, telephone conferences on, was the issue of safe level of exposure. Now, in the epidemiologic studies, you really could not take that information directly. But with the issue that they wanted to see was, do we have experimental systems that could test whether there was a safe level of exposure? This is the key issue that everybody focused on. And to the extent that we had experimental systems, we believed at the end, and this is again, this is not a simple decision, that we could not determine the safe level of exposure, so therefore we would have to continue to tell the public that there is no safe level of exposure, which again gets down to this very same issue. That is that if somebody else has secondhand smoke and gets exposure, it's not just less and it's okay, it's not safe. The other one, which I think is also potentially obvious to scientists, is that it depends on the duration and level of exposure of tobacco smoke. That also was, we focused a long time on that to make sure that was the case. Uh, because again, it could be stochastic, it could be a threshold effect. There are other damaging agents that we're familiar with that, that don't have that relationship. Um, the three areas that I think really came out the strongest in the science, and believe me, we discussed for a long time even which areas to talk about and be able to write about, were really three areas. The first one was the low level of exposure leading to endothelial dysfunction and inflammation. Again, a lot of mechanistic data to, to really show that beautifully now, and, and that came out very, very nicely. Uh, cancer, which I've talked a little bit about the fact, for example, of P53 mutations, etc., is the nexus, I think, for this whole report, because we have such detailed information. But the issue that it's caused by DNA damage and inflammation and how that happens, how you damage DNA specifically, how each carcinogen specifically affects different parts of the DNA, of the DNA, which mutations are involved by those carcinogens. Some of that is in such exquisite detail that, I mean, it's beautiful to read, but again, the message is, it's not just a black box. We know how smoking causes cancer, and that was part of what we tried to bring out in this report. And again, for cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases, a lot of we talked this morning, and you've heard also about the issue of inflammation and oxidative damage and how that is related, again, directly to those diseases. Um, and then the last one, which is obviously one of the most important points, and again, it's the message that was repeated throughout as we kept discussing this, was cessation is superior to any specific product modification. I'm going to get into that because that was a, an area of controversy, and I want to talk about that in, in, in great detail. So again, for the lay public, you know, we have all these chapters on you know pulmonary diseases and inflammation and oxidative damage and everything else, and what it comes down to is some very specific messages. Poison. There's a lot of poisons in cigarette smoke, and you're going to see how nice the material is on that. You can get addicted. Addiction. Just a summary on cancer, on circulatory disorders, and respiratory diseases. A very, very nice section on children. Uh, again, that also relates to the same issue of secondhand smoke. And then the other issue at the end, the most important message at the end, is quit. 
how you can quit, why you should quit, and all the ways we can help you quit. This is a very important message that's going to be delivered from this. So um, early on, when I started to, when we had the first sit-down meeting, that we sit around with the, the chapter editors, I mean, I have to tell you, you, you suddenly begin to see the daunting task. Uh, every single name you propose is vetted, revetted, due diligence, check, double checks. Are the experts in the field? Is there somebody better? Who else would they recommend? And you get down to the list, we actually ended up with 64 authors that are part of this report. And each one of them, again, just a super expert in the field, and, and again, I have to you know, publicly thank every one of them. Um, but very early on, one of the things that came out is what I call the 600 pound gorilla. And what, what, what happened to me, and I have to tell you as a scientist, I was really, I was really um, nervous because I understand that this, this document is gonna be a big, big part of policy. But I felt from the very beginning, and I have to tell you that I'm very thankful to David Burns because he really supported me on this, is that at least a priori we could not come with this conclusion. I can tell you that there were people that came to the table that said, we wanna make sure that the final conclusion is you cannot reduce harm in any product. You cannot take something out of a cigarette and make it safer. And I said, you know, that may sound like, a, that sounds right, and it sounds like a great policy point in terms of where you want to stand, but as a scientist, I think we need to understand whether there is information that supports or doesn't support that hypothesis, like any other hypothesis. I, for example, said I can't believe, for example, that if you take out benzopyrene completely from cigarette smoke, that it's going to be quite as toxic or quite as carcinogenic, for example, as a cigarette that has benzopyrene. I can't believe, for example, that if you take out nicotine and lower it, and we know, the lawyers know this very well, the companies, the tobacco companies lowered nicotine because it was bitter. They found sales were going down, and then they started growing plants that had more nicotine in them. So I said, there's no way that you can't tell me that I put less nicotine in, the, in tobacco, people are not going to be less addicted. So I think that the hypothesis is certainly not supported to be that simple. And I think the issue that we finally all agreed upon, uh, and this is, by the way, the final statement, so I'm taking it all the way to the end after three years, but what we all agreed upon is that there really are two issues. One of them is, can you take out a product and make it safer? And then how can you prove it? That's the difficult part. So we could all understand that if certain compounds of cigarette smoke are going to be dangerous and reducing them might make it safer, how could you ever prove it and how could you then give that information correctly to the public? And then I think we all got on the same page. Because then we all agreed that there was no reduced harmful product that was out there that had been shown to be safer and to reduce these diseases. And that made it easier from a policy point of view, even though the science was true to the science in terms of trying to look at whether these components were important or not. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of the flavor of what comes out of this, because, you know, the, the science you can read, and they'll come out soon. By the way, I hear that any day now we're going to get final clearance. By the way, it's been in clearance for nine months, which I understand is the longest of any Surgeon General report ever, okay? And you'll find out why in a second. But, you know, if it finally does get to the last wordsmithing that's done, it should be announced any day, literally. It'll come out any week now. Um, the, the, um, here, there's an area here that says tobacco keeps your body under attack. If you spill drain cleaner on your skin, it would hurt and become inflamed. If you did this many times a day, your skin would not get a chance to heal. It would stay red, irritated, and inflamed. This is similar to what happens with tobacco. The organs in your body have an inner lining of cells and they continue to get damaged, etc. So this is the kind of language besides working on this report that we had to work on to try to get in the simplistic terms to get the public to understand what all this great science means to them. Because, you know, if you write about all mechanisms, it's not going to make a difference. And I frankly think, I have to tell you, I think it's actually a very good piece of work. And, and there was a lot of, again, Jonathan Salmon and David Burns were very concerned that this would somehow dumb down the report and make it, you know, I said, look, this is for a different audience. I'll tell you along the way, which I tried to get, but unfortunately I can't, um, in addition to that, because it is 2010, the report now will have a live interactive website when it comes out, which is very cool. So you can go in, and when you click on, for example, cancer, it has these, these uh, animations which take you through the formation of cancer in the body, and you can actually click on any part of the body and see how all the different things cause different damage in different parts of the body. So it's very cool. Um, and, you know, I get it's people that are working well in parallel with you to take that information and decipher it down to a way that, uh, that makes sense. Um, I thought this was actually brilliant. I thought this little piece here was absolutely fantastic. Look at the way they, they characterize cancer-causing chemicals, toxic metals, and poison gases. Right? You can say the words. 
What does that mean, right? And you can also write down the chemical formulas and that becomes even less meaningful. But look what they've done. They've taken some of the most common things that we see all around that have these, you know, these skeletons on them and everything else, and man, they just looked at their bad for you. I mean, you're not gonna drink the stuff, you're not gonna eat the stuff, right? And here they show you, this is all the stuff that's in tobacco. It's really bad stuff. And I, I think they did it very, very nicely. And it says at the very top, over 7,000 chemicals, hundreds are toxic, more than 50 can cause cancer. Here are a few, and then they show you them like this. I think it's a very powerful message. Again, a very nice way of taking all these chemical compounds and making them into something that is meaningful to the average person. So I talked to you about one of the major points that, that, that was very well delineated, delineated in one of our chapters, and that is the issue of addiction. And again, you know, just, just recently, I don't know if you noticed the Nature Genetics, uh, just last week, I think, there was a beautiful art, uh, article, you looking at, I think, almost 30,000 people, very, very well done genetic study, that uh, polymorphisms in the nicotine receptor could make you susceptible to increased smoking and eventually, at least some association with potentially then to an increased risk of cancer. Um, now, again, this is one that was controversial. Uh, the lawyers in the group will remember something called the constitutive, the constitutive hypothesis. If you remember the tobacco companies used to use. And what they would say is, oh, it's not our product, it's the person. Right? The person has some predetermined craziness that they want to smoke. We just offer it to them. We're not doing anything to them. So anytime you get into this notion that the genetic makeup influences whether you want to smoke and how much you smoke, it makes public policy people very, very, very nervous. But again, what we did is we broke through that and we said, look, the issue is here, we all understand that there's nicotine addiction, and we can you know, place that message here and make it very well, and make it, uh, place it very well in a in readable fashion, and in fact, it does it very well. You see here, you have somebody who's holding their head and saying, oh, I want to quit, essentially, and, and it really walks you through the reason why you get addicted. And I think the very powerful message here is that uh, the second sentence there. Nicotine is, highly, is a highly addictive drug. Almost everyone who smokes or uses tobacco regularly is addicted to nicotine. It sounds simple, but you know, again, this is now supported by a, a very, very wide swath of scientific evidence. And the message is that first cigarette could be enough. You get nicotine in your body, you get addicted, and guess what? Then you start the process of nicotine addiction. Again, a very, very powerful message. And again, if you can imagine, if you look, especially when you go to the website, this is really geared to young people, trying to keep them from starting to smoke and trying to get them to quit as early as possible. Um, the, the, um, this is further emphasized here at the top. Teens are more sensitive to nicotine. So we have, again, every day, 3,900 teens start smoking. Still horrible, right? It's a lot of kids. Um, and then I think the other section which you've seen, which I like very much, here, they have a lady here breaking the cigarette, but at the bottom it says the good news is, and it really also, it not only tells you that you can't quit, the products that are available to help you quit, but then also sends you to a variety of websites which can help you and support you and tell you where to go if you want additional information uh, to do that. Breaking off from, from that, and we'll get back to, to other parts of the report in a second, um, I wanted to, to uh, and I've mentioned some of these, but I wanted to get into a little bit of detail as to what I saw as a scientist sitting among so many people that had so much vested into writing this report. Um, the, first thing, the first thing we encountered was something that we frankly didn't even expect until we started writing the conclusions. So we were all writing our chapters and everything else, and then I realized that probably my most important job was to write the conclusions. Again, at the end of each chapter, there's these very specific conclusions. You can, you know, quote 10,000 papers and do whatever you want. The conclusions is what people are going to look at. And then those get distilled down further into the final conclusions in the final chapter. Well, interestingly enough, if you look at all the other Surgeon General reports, Surgeon General report, you'll see that in general, epidemiologists have come together against level together in determining levels of evidence. And if you remember them, they all say the you know the evidence is sufficient, the evidence is not sufficient, right? You know, how do you, how do you put that information together so that it's clear that there's staggered ways that you can put that information together in terms of level of evidence? Well, the only problem was nobody ever wrote a mechanistic paper before, a mechanistic uh, report. And so the problem is that, you know, a lot of it was science and hypothesis building. You know, hypothesis is not wrong, right? We all learned that early on in science. It's, it can be supported and not supported, eventually become, you know, well, well enough supported that it becomes, you know, that it becomes proof. But the bottom line is that a lot of the information we're dealing with is very powerful, but we weren't sure as to how to determine that level of evidence. And actually, 
I have to take off my hat. In addition to David Burns, Jonathan Salmon, who was at Hopkins at the time, spent a lot of time with me personally. And we went through this over and over again, knocking down different language back and forth until we agreed. And you're going to see in this new report that there's really two specific conclusions that we make. One of them is leads to. We felt that leads to was the strongest statement we could make. For example, benzyl firings lead to DNA damage, which leads to a P53 mutation. We felt that evidence was very strong and we could say things like that. In other cases, we felt that there was a little bit of a link missing or papers perhaps were mostly on the side on one side of the hypothesis, but there was controversial evidence, but it was still predominantly on one side, and then we would say consistent evidence. And then we didn't put things that we didn't think there was any evidence to, to be able to support that or sufficient evidence to do that. And so we felt, felt it was just better from a scientific point of view and did deviate from the previous reports. Another area which everybody was very excited about, and we had just, that was a very big disappointing area, is biomarkers. Everybody felt that with mechanisms and understanding the, the, the molecular biology behind these diseases, that we could start writing about all kinds of biomarkers that you could start following, and that, you know, when people get exposed to cigarette smoke, you could start finding DNA addicts, and you could start finding DNA changes in the blood, and in the sputum, and in the oral cavity, and that it would be really great. And you know what, when we looked at that information, it was great, interesting information that just was not at a level of evidence that allowed us to really put these biomarkers forward. This is an area that I work in a lot, and unfortunately, other than two or three that we were able to put forward, it was one of the great disappointment. We, we asked the authors to really focus on this, and then we ended up taking out a lot of that information out. I already talked to you about the risk-free level of tobacco exposure. Another thing we tried to do in this report, because it was mechanistic, was we tried not to just do one disease. So at the beginning, Jonathan and I were working on maybe ways to do like inflammation, how inflammation was important, you know, both as lowering you know, your ability to, for the immune system to act, both in causing damage, both in causing uh, pulmonary disease and, and, and cardiovascular diseases and cancer. That ended up being very, very difficult. It was just very, very hard. And we ended up, again, the way the information was organized in the literature, it was very hard to be able to put that together. So we did put the links in there, but you're just not going to see that kind of general across diseases, across different organs type of information. The other one that, that again, became a, an interesting point was genetic predisposition. A lot of concerns from people that had dealt with tobacco about whether we're going to give them fuel and ammunition for the constitutive hypothesis that, you know, people are predetermined. But in the end, the evidence was so strong, we put it in there, we felt that it was extremely necessary. And then the, the bottom point is one that deserves mentioning. From the moment I sat down, everybody said, oh, this is going to be a very important report because we think very soon the FDA is going to regulate tobacco. And so that was the big thing that was hanging over everybody, right? And of course, when we were going to go to clearance in April of 2009, which is why all this material says 2009, they knew that it was going to come to pass, and you know, the Obama signed by law, in law, into law, June 11th of 2009, the, the uh, legislation which actually allows the FDA now to regulate tobacco. Now, it's very complicated legislation, but it'd be very interesting because one of the key issues there is regulate, regulating the amount of nicotine in cigarettes, and also if there's anything before 2007 that was marketed that's equivalent, they really don't have that much say, but anything that gets changed significantly, any product they try to put onto the market that is a substantial change in the eyes of the FDA now needs a PMA, a pre-market approval, just like a drug. That is a big stick to be able to hold, to hold over the tobacco industry. Well, as soon as that came out, the report just went back into a black hole. Everybody that had seen it wanted to go back and see it again. They wanted to look at the language again. They wanted to see how this was going to impact with this, this new uh, regulation that came out. So coming back a little bit to the report, this is the one on cancer. Um, and, you know, they, again, the emphasis was here was on how cancer is formed by a progression of events, genetic and epigenetic events and how tobacco smoke seems to be the perfect thing to do that. It just has so many things that help every aspect of the process from initiation, promotion, diminishing the immune system, etc. And the other thing which, is, which I thought was very important to highlight is you see that little purple box there. You know, we all think, and everybody says, right, that when it comes to cancer, the tobacco predominantly causes lung cancer, neck cancer, and then the list gets thinner as you think through it, right? That's not true. Cigarette smoke is absorbed in the body, goes into the circulation, and gets to every single cell in your body, including the brain. And so we now know, with very good epidemiologic studies, and now there's mechanistic studies to support it, that virtually every cancer that we can accurately measure is increased in people that smoke. And so we really wanted to make it a very important point. And if you look down there, that's pretty much all of cancer. I mean, everything else is probably not there because we just don't have enough epidemiologic evidence. 
And we wanted to make the point that there is not just one type of cancer. Don't think that just because I may not get lung cancer, I'm going to be okay. Or because of that. I mean, this is the notion here is that every single type of cancer is increased. The risk is increased if you smoke, and we wanted to put that message out. And then at the end, which is um, at the end of this section, which is um, again the important message, almost all lung cancer is avoidable. The other side of the point, of course, is that lung cancer is very rare in people that don't smoke. And so the issue here that we put down here is that it's avoidable. If you don't smoke, you may not get this disease as many of the other cancers that you have. And again, not, not, you'll, we'll go into the secondhand smoking message, especially as it relates to children. And the good news is you can quit, that there is evidence that when you quit, the chances of getting cancer go down, et cetera. So all these messages are put in, into a positive vein at the end with hopefully a better understanding of what's going on. This is also for um, diseases in your heart and arteries. Uh, we, uh, again, wordsmithing, we stuck for a long time in how to talk about inflammation and plaque formation and, and, um, and in general, um, uh, just hyperactivity of, of, of arteries. And, you know, we came up with the word sticky blood. <laughs> so not everybody liked it, but we thought it kind of made sense, you know, things get stuck up in your, in your blood vessel. And it was a simple message, and again, there was a lot of controversy about how to say it. Um, but again, the, 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 highest, the highest rank, which is these red these boxes that we have at the beginning, is that you, your risk of heart attack is much higher. Uh, high cholesterol and anything else it has just makes it all worse. This problem, whatever we want to call it, is just much worse when you smoke. And again, that this is a major, major leading cause of, of tobacco-related uh, deaths. And so again, put in very nicely. And again, you know, with pictures that were, I think, very, very well thought out. They're actually here. It's a little bit of a picture showing you how smoking increases plaque formation. Um, and then again, an emphasis, which I think is, again, a great tribute to family, because I think it's on everybody's mind, secondhand smoke. And if you see here on the right-hand side, secondhand smoke triggers heart attacks. And how do they know that? Well, it's not just even mechanistic anymore, right? We know that because of all the public policy that's been going on in the public smoking bans. And what's very nice is it shows you the decrease in incidence uh, per, per thousand in the population in places that have enacted strong anti-smoking laws. Uh, so again, very nice pieces of information tied very nicely together to show you that, again, what is the cause, what am I concerned about, what can I do about it? I mean, this was the other very important message that kept coming throughout the whole thing. But here, smoking damages your lungs and breathing, so here the word was scars, right? Again, you can't imagine how long we spent trying to find these words. But you know, everything else that happens, it scars your lung. How else can you describe damage that is in cancer? So there's, there's, the section really focuses on how all these things that actually, the tobacco scars your lungs. Um, and, and again, the notion here was a little bit of a mixed message. It takes about two or three years to get your lung function back. Uh, but again, if you go to the, um, to, to the second case, it talks about all the diseases that we are obviously very familiar with here. Uh, diseases which affect, again, not only smokers, but, but many people that are affected by secondhand smoke. Probably the ones that affect the class the most. Um, and uh, that is why there's also such an emphasis on the secondhand issue here. Um, unfortunately, and this is one of the first drawbacks of the Surgeon's Journal Report. Remember, we started four years ago. And most of the information pretty much gets put down in stone within about the first 15 months. And the rest of it is all words to do. You just can't go back. If you try to go back, I try. You leave me as a scientist and say, let's go back and put this information. Uh, it's all over. Because there are so many pieces that have to be put into place and so many people have to review it that you just can't go back and insert this information and put a new reference in. It's unfortunate. So unfortunately, it's old. And for example, the papers that were quoted today, uh, Charlie quoted a paper. Uh, there's a paper in our folder here about, for example, secondhand smoking bronchitis. It's not, in the, it's not in that report anymore, it's for the next report. Uh, and so, for example, that was not emphasized in this particular area because we simply didn't have it at that time. And here's one that I think is very close to our hearts. Uh, smoking has reprodu you know, harms reproduction and children's health. And you know, obviously this is the one that almost everybody agreed upon. Um, I have to tell you, we have a chapter, and this is one of the chapters that I found most challenging because it's really not my area at all. And um, I have to tell you, when I was reading it, I was surprised. Smoking is really bad. You know, it's um, as bad as I thought it was for, for cancer and everything else. It's amazing. I mean, it's like you couldn't create things. If somebody told you to create things that could kill sperms, harm eggs, you know, kill cancer, I mean, it's unbelievable. And this stuff does it. It's incredible. And the information, the level of information that these authors put together to support this and how adamant they were about, you know, putting it together was really, was really quite impressive. 
and you know, here it is, but it's, it's pretty straightforward, and it definitely decreases fertility, and of course, women that, that smoke, you know, as we know, have preterm babies that are, and also babies that are much smaller, and as we all know, obviously, because of that exposure, they have a lifelong risk of developing many, many pulmonary uh, diseases. Um, so here there was a lot, of, a, a lot of emphasis, and those three bullet points are, are the biggies. You know, during pregnancy, exposure to tobacco smoke may make risky pregnancy more likely, lead to preterm delivery, and lead to miscarriage. Um, and then it talks a little bit about the relationship between uh, the, the mothers and the responsibility to the babies, which, you know, and obviously their life, again, there's lifetime risk for SIDS, for example, um, and as well as for other respiratory disorders. And then this is the one that I'm very proud of because, um, again, and, and you know, I, I, I'm going to say this too many times, but family has a lot to be proud of. I just do not believe that before family w was established, there was just so much emphasis, emphasis across the board on secondhand smoke. And everybody understood that everything we did, we also had to talk about secondhand smoke. And this is the one where I think it came out the most. And what they have here is they actually have a picture of mom in one room smoking and a baby someplace else. And really trying to illustrate the fact that that's just not safe for the baby. That basically, you know, that environmentally this is going to spread out throughout the entire room and there's going to be toxins in the entire, in the entire house. And that really, you should really aim for a tobacco-free environment for your kids. Um, and it, it's beautifully written and actually when you'll see the website come down also, there's a very nice story about doing that as well. But here the emphasis is again, is it's just not safe, just don't do it. And whatever you can, you've got to diminish it. There's not this issue that you heard about, as long as they don't own the baby here, as long as the ashes aren't falling on his head. I mean, this is all about, and this is again, this is mechanistically based. So we're not writing this because we like to. We're not writing this because we think it's good policy. We're writing this because the report has some very specific information to support these uh, mechanisms and, and, how, uh, and how this occurs. So I think this is something to, to really be um, very, very proud of. Uh, the final message, which is uh, the big message at the end, is obviously that now is the time to quit smoking, chewing, or dipping tobacco. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, it's, it's, it's again, very, very informative, and, and with these interactive websites, the real, the real thing here is, is not only to understand that it's very dangerous, but really to understand uh, what you might be able to, uh, to do about it. So just to start wrapping it up, I, I want to just give you some final reflections on, on, on writing this thing. Uh, one of them is I could not have done it with mentors, and I mentioned them several times, but David Burns, who got me into this, at least helped me a lot while I was doing it, so I have to give him credit. And he was also extremely helpful in being really, really, uh, really looking at it behind me because there's just a lot of push, and you know, it's, it's a charged atmosphere. This is something that's very important to a lot of people, and everybody knows that when this thing comes out, every single word is going to be quoted. Every single word is going to be quoted, and it's not going to be by the good guys either. You know, the bad guys are also going to go and look for every word and see what you said or you didn't say or whether you said it was sufficient or not sufficient. Or the, and that's what just kills you as you're writing this because you know that if you don't put it in there, they know that there wasn't enough evidence and they've got that. They've got that one chopped up on their side. And so, you know, it, it was really important. And, when, you know, in the end, David Burns specifically really supported me when I, when I thought the science came down on one side or the other. Uh, the other one, of course, was Jonathan Salmon, and because he was local, he really helped me a lot with, with, um, with that as well. It was also, I think more than anybody else, understood the timelines that were involved. And when we had to work on something fast, sometimes he and I would just work on it together just to get it out, to get to the next step. So again, I really thank both of them. The contributors, 64, 64 authors, unbelievable. Um, really, once, once we had all these conference calls and decided specifically on what we were going to write, they all pretty much produced the work within three or four months, which is phenomenal. Because there is a tremendous amount of literature review that has to be done. Everything has to be documented. They really did their work. And also, when we went back to them with all the edits, and for a while you go back to them because they have to prove it, and then it finally gets out of their hands, they were all excellent and very, very good. Um, the, the one shock I had was a number of versions. I have to tell you that in my corner of my office, I had what probably was equivalent to a desk full of just documents that kept coming out. I, I kept losing track of which version we were working on because it just kept going and going and going. And every time I said, ah, this is it. We got it. You know, everybody agrees on the language. Oh, no, we're going to get to another level of clearance and another, another uh, group of eyes that has to look at it. Now, the CDC staff is amazing. They keep the glue that makes all this happen. Uh, the words, I have to tell you, I never knew words were so important. I, you know, I, I mean, sometimes I just felt like, you know, how, I mean, what's the difference? They mean exactly the same thing, but I have to tell you, they really knew the meaning of words. Everyone, every person that was involved that had done this before, you know, would tell you, well, I remember when we wrote this, and, you know, and, and they just didn't want to write it like that again. So, 
you just had to go with their advice. The number of agencies involved was also pretty impressive. Um, at the end, you know, some, some of the clearance that sometimes is automatic, like in that H and FDA, was not automatic because of the, uh, the new law that was put into place. And that's one of the reasons we're still in clearance. And again, we've been in clearance now for nine months. And the other thing which I think is, you know, I, I think is evident from what I've said so far is the importance of the message. It was incredibly evident from the beginning that it, it wasn't just about the science. The science is very important, but the way you communicate that science was what it was all about. And then understanding the implications it would have really for the population at large. And um, the importance of that message to me was something that I appreciated a lot, and now I appreciate it even more when I see all the materials that have been produced and exactly, you know, when you don't even understand where it's all going to head, what you finally see as a, as a final product. Um, so, you know, the acknowledgement is Regina Benjamin. Uh, I have to say, I probably had the strangest working relationship that anybody's had with the Surgeon General because simply Regina Benjamin wasn't approved until the process was over. Uh, so, you know, and she wrote some very nice stuff about the work and the people that did the work, etc. And I'm sure, you know, it's, 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 it's meaningful. And, and again, I, you know, understanding where she comes from, I, I, you know, she's obviously very supportive of this and did obviously look at the final product and everything else. But I didn't miss that. I didn't have what some of the others had with an active Surgeon General the opportunity to discuss what was going on. Um, just simply, you know, the way it worked out politically in terms of uh, terms, it just uh, didn't work out. And um, you know, it ends finally with this information where you can get it. And this is just the point where I want to say that uh, Family is a wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, you, you know, we know here because we hear the science how important it is. We know here also what a group of people we're working with. When you see the videos and you see the clips and you see them actually sitting down and you talk to them, you know how this could not have been possible without them and the fight that they did and the people that supported them in the Rosenblatt the entire board that, that, that really works to make this happen. Um, but sometimes I think we also forget that this is so big that it's not just what happens in these symposiums and in this room. And I have to tell you that the most important thing that I learned from doing the Surgeon General Report, and I think something that everybody here has to hold true, is that it goes well beyond this room. And the impact is being felt. And my message to you is do not deviate from the path Beth told me to remind everybody that when we started this, I said, I think we're getting on a truck, and those that are going to be on the truck are going to be on, and everybody else is going to fall out of the way. And I have to tell you, we are on that truck. It's still moving. Don't let anything dissuade you or anybody dissuade you what you have to do, because the impact is being felt. And every year you're in existence, and every year that you fund these investigators, is one year that we get closer to killing the scourge and getting secondhand smoke out of the way, and hopefully smoking out of the way for it. Thank you very much. Thank you.